Good morning, everyone. Whether you're here in person or following us online. Uh, just a couple of messages. The lovely flowers today have been given by Dennis Lee, remembering his sister Gwyneth. Um, one important message constitutionally is that we have here after the service in two weeks time on Sunday, April the 28th, a church meeting. So that's two weeks time, church meeting after our service. And now it's my pleasure to welcome our friend Janet England from West Horsley, an old acquaintance of this church, and we're always glad to see you, and we look forward very much to hearing your message. We'll commence our service after a few moments' silence now. Good morning. morning. I bring greetings from West Horsley Church, Methodist Church, as we gather together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to praise and worship him together this morning, whether we're here in person or online, we're one worshipping community. Let us continue as we sing together number 311, The Day of Resurrection. Join together in prayer. Let us pray together. A prayer of approach. With word and silence, prayer and song, we come together to worship, a worshipping people before our God. Risen Lord, risen at Easter, risen and in our hearts, 
be real and present with us in this time. Teach us and encourage us. Speak to us through stories old and new, so that with fresh eyes we can see again the glories of your being. We come with adoration, love and amazement at the glimpses and sights you give us of your being, at the love you enfold us with, at the voices that speak and sing your words, of the visions that reveal your presence, at the way you gently teach us and guide us, O Lord our God, in awe and wonder we adore you this day. Holy Spirit of God, we thank you for dwelling within us, for your comforting presence, your assurance that the path to righteous and goodness is with you. <coughs> Servant Jesus, Son of God, we thank you that when you walk the earth, you serve those around us, blessing and healing, guiding and being with them. Father God, we thank you that you gave us birth and that you have nurtured and guided, loved and protected us. Here and now, accept our thanks and praise. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen. And let us share together the family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us sing together now. We're going to have two songs. They're number 332 and 333. So if you're following the hymn book, they're next door to each other. And we're going to sing both of them through twice. So number 332 and 333.
our two readings. Um, it's slightly the reverse of how you normally hear them. So the first reading is a gospel reading from the gospel according to St. Luke, and the second reading is from the book of Acts. The reading from St. Luke's gospel is the very end of that gospel. And to set it in context, context, it follows the walk, what we normally call the walk to Emmaus. And after Jesus has made himself known by the breaking of the bread, the two friends rush back to Jerusalem to tell the others what has happened. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still not believe it because of joy and amazement he asks them do you have anything to here to eat they gave him a piece of grilled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence he said to them this is what i told you while i was still with you Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Now the next reading, as you can see, is from Acts chapter 3. And um, verse 19 actually runs into verse 20, uh, such is the arrangement of the words. So beginning at um, verse 12, we have, When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham... Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, although he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One, and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah 
who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. May God bless to us a full understanding of these readings. Thank you for our readings this morning. This year, on Easter Sunday morning, I finally made it for the first time to the sunrise service at Newark Priory, just outside Ripley. Now, it is not good that this was the first time that I had made it to the sunrise service on Easter Sunday morning. The reason it's not good is because the distance between West Horsley and Ripley is not exactly great, and I moved into West Horsley in 1999. So I had had 24 previous opportunities to make the sunrise service at Newark Priory. And I had failed. It's not good. The reason I particularly wanted to go to Newark Priory, for those of you who may or may not know, uh, it's a ruined abbey just outside Ripley, and it sits on private land. So the Priory is, the ruins are closed throughout the year, except on Easter Sunday morning at six o'clock in the morning when it is open for the sunrise service. It was a beautiful morning. It was frosty. The setting is stunning. There was a lot of low-lying mist. Because the clocks had changed, it was dark when we set out, but the sun did indeed come up while we were standing at the ruins there. It was quite well attended. And they lit, lit a brazier. We sang what's going to be our final hymn today, Thy Be the Glory, apart from other ones. But I did get a real sense at that service, as the dawn came up, a real sense of being there at the rising of the sun in both senses of the word, on Easter Sunday morning at the rising of the sun. We are still in the season of Easter. And those two days between Good Friday and Easter Sunday are two days that changed the world. Our reading this morning, we hear about how the disciples are together. We don't know much about what the disciples were doing at that time, but they appear to be gathering, staying together. What would they have been thinking? Are they thinking, this is it, it's over, it's finished? All that riding into Jerusalem with the cheering crowds, all that jubilation, and now this. Or are they expecting something more? Are they thinking that something just might happen. I'm going to read you a poem. It's called Legacy. And it's written by uh, a poet called Godfrey Rust. And it's particularly pertinent to the time before the Resurrection Sunday. I have travelled light so that the leaving should be easier. What I bequeath is left according to your will and this New Testament. These are the words of Jesus, of course. I leave a church to be built on a broken rock. I leave nothing written down. I hear my word blown freely on the winds of Galilee to, the, to seed the hearts of men. I leave no money, debts or property, no house for shrine, no artifact for relic. I leave just the remnants of a meal, 
My cloak is cast aside and gambled for. I leave no tomb to raid, no corpse to disinter, no fingerprints, no blood, no DNA. I could have gained the world, but nothing now stands between us but this one last legacy. Because it is written, because it holds the only power with which to un that the trap of human death will be unsprung. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So the disciples had gathered together, united in grief, despair, shock, a lack of understanding. Is there anything for them to hope for? We hear in the Easter accounts some of the emotions that different characters go through. The women are troubled and bewildered. The disciples heard the women's words and thought they were nonsense. But Peter sees the empty tomb and is left wondering. In our reading, when Jesus comes to the disciples and says the words, peace be with you, the outcome is the exact opposite of peace. The disciples are startled and frightened. And they start to realize that they are really seeing Jesus, but they're not, it says, they still did not believe because of joy and amazement. I take that to mean that they were just confused. Their joy and amazement was coupled with confusion and bewilderment, and they couldn't really believe what had happened. And in the readings, We're told that Jesus tells them to go and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins. And he says repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name. And in the reading from Act 3, that is exactly what is starting to happen. Jesus says in verse 19, Repent then and turn to God so that he will forgive your sins. If you do, times of spiritual strength will come from the Lord, and he will send Jesus, who is the Messiah, he has already chosen for you. So already at the beginning of Acts, Peter is starting to preach what Jesus has told him to preach, repentance and the forgiveness of sins. We see everything in those accounts through the prism of the resurrection. But the disciples only had the here and now, what was happening to them at that moment, trying to understand. In some ways I see Holy Week a bit like a, a funnel. At the beginning of Holy Week you've got the ride into Jerusalem, you've got all the crowds cheering for Jesus, and gradually over the week the people fall away and fall away until you get to the point when Jesus on the cross says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then at that point, it start, with the resurrection, it starts to open out again. And first the women see that Jesus has risen, and then the disciples, and then they start to proclaim the gospel. And so it broadens out again, and it carries on, continuous to this day, eternally, the church carrying on like a funnel, growing. It's also interesting, I think, what Jesus told his disciples to do, what he actually instructed his disciples to say. And in the reading from Luke, he says to his disciples in verse 47 to 49, 
he says, the Messiah must suffer and must rise from the dead. And in his name, the message about repentance and the forgiveness of sins must be preached to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are the witness of these things. And I myself will send upon you what my father has promised. But you must wait in the city until the power from above comes down upon you. And in Matthew, the Great Commission, Jesus tells his disciples to go and make disciples of all men. And then in Acts 4, Peter proclaims that salvation is found in no one else but Jesus. But whatever message they are delivering, forgiveness, salvation, be disciples, it's all about Jesus Christ, the Messiah from Nazareth. We often hear people telling us the importance of being disciples, and that can be a little bit daunting. But Barry Tabraham used a great phrase last week at our church, which I really liked. He said, you need to gossip the gospel. I like gossip the gospel. That kind of makes it manageable and makes it doable. We can all do that. You may remember the Methodist movement that ran from 1988 to 2007, which was known as Easter People. Some of you might even have gone to it. And that was a big movement that was all about renewing and growing the Christian faith in the lives of individuals and in the church. And it was based around the four Methodist alls, as they're known as. And those alls, A-double-L-S, are all need to be saved, all may be saved, all may know they are saved, and all may be saved to the uttermost. I'm just going to read with you what that actually means. All need to be saved. No one is perfect. And without our perfection, our relationship with God is marred and distorted, so all need to be saved. All may be saved. No one is beyond the reach of God's redeeming love. All people have the opportunity to respond to God's love, finding forgiveness for past errors, peace and strength in the present. All may know they are saved. Salvation has nothing to do with what we have done for God, but everything to do with what God has done for us in Christ. All may be saved to the uttermost. There are no limitations on the work that God can do to reshape and recreate his image in the life of an individual. There are no limits to how God can change a person from the inside out. That is what it means when we say a person may be saved to the uttermost. I want to leave you with a short poem again by Godfrey Rust. And it's called Mary. And if you ask me what a Christian is, I'd say, not one who's pure in word and deed, or goes to all the Sunday services, or says their prayers, or knows the proper creed. But that one who would gladly give away all that they have now or ever have been, to stand between the dark tomb and the day, and know the moment of the Magdalene. Amen. We're going to sing together number 309, See What a Morning.
quiet reflection. And I think you've all been given pieces of paper and pencils. If you want to write down any prayers that you would like to share, our prayers of intercession this morning are actually going to be a, a hymn that we're going to sit and sing together. But we'll have a reflection first, and then I'll say a bit more about the prayers. So a moment of quiet. So our prayers of intercession this morning are actually going to be uh, some. It's number 109, but before we come to that, feel free to write down any prayers that you want to, and also any prayer requests that come in online. We'd like to offer those up as well. Um, this morning, we will have woken up to the news that Iran had fired missiles on Israel, and as I was preparing, the news flash was that however Israel responds, it will affect the whole of the Middle East. So we've got that context. We have the context of Gaza and what's been going on there and the people constantly moving to find safety. Um, we still have Ukraine, and you may not know this, but Ukrainian families in this country are still moving around, um, trying to find the next place to go. So these are the context of our prayers, but please feel free to write any prayers down. And in a few minutes, we will sing seated uh, number 109 from In Singing the Faith. Do we have a plate? Do you have a plate there that we can use to gather the prayers? Yeah, please. That would be lovely. Thank you so much.
I won't be reading the prayers out for the obvious reason there's far too many of them. And we'll be here a long time. But what I'd like to do is to place them down here and then please feel free after the service to come and, and read through all the prayers that, that everyone has offered um, and to pray them, to pray them on behalf of people. So I'll read out the prayers from online and then we will sing number 109. Let us pray. Please pray for Adam, Kayla, Lizzie and Melly, Molly. They returned from holiday with a tummy bug to which Molly has now succumbed. So please pray for their health. And pray for the deepening crisis in the Middle East, for wisdom and courage for all who have influence for peace. And Father, as we offer all these prayers from our hearts, we offer these to you. You know what we are thinking, you know what we are praying. And we pray that we will be able to pray for and with each other as we offer our prayers to you. Amen. So let us sing.
And so let us bless our offertory. Father God, we bless the gifts that we bring to you this morning. And we bless the gifts that we bring of ourselves. And ask that you can use everything that we have to offer to disciple about you and to spread your word. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 313, Thine Be the Glory. to share the grace with each other. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
Looking, easy over, to looking over the top of the glasses, doing the old lady thing. <laughs>